This thesis is an exploration and analysis of the most efficient and appropriate ways policymakers, planners, and individuals can tap into the knowledge held by indigenous peoples around the world in order to improve urban environments to make them more sustainable and resilient to the effects of the climate crisis. Now more than ever, it is crucial to contextualize all human behaviors and practices with our history as a species. One of the best ways of doing this is lifting the voices of historically marginalized and silenced groups. By incorporating knowledge and wisdom that has been traditionally ignored into all individual and societal practices, the boundaries between the human and natural worlds can be redefined. By examining the potential that the wealth of knowledge held within indigenous cosmologies, traditions, and practices has in regard to improving urban sustainability, a number of possibilities for integrating indigenous traditional ecological knowledge, also known as tech or TEK, into the modern sustainability movement are assessed. So to start off, just want to make a note about terminology. Throughout the thesis in this presentation, I use the words indigenous peoples to address the collective of diverse people throughout the globe that self-identify as distinct groups characterized by a historical connection to territories and surrounding natural environments prior to colonial settler societies. And I'm using indigenous rather than Indian or native or first peoples, since it is the accepted terminology to refer to the collective of these groups. And Peoples, rather than communities or nations or tribes or other vocabulary, is used to intentionally promote the rights of these distinct non-dominant groups to autonomy, self-governance, and treatment with respect and dignity by nation-state governments in their collective capacity as dictated by international law and just ethics. So to start off, I just want to talk about the reflexivity practice that I went through in order to do this presentation, basically addressing the question, who am I to be talking about this as a white person complicit in Western capitalist culture from the global north, not belonging to an indigenous group? Why am I the one telling you all about these things? And it's, you know, at the surface level, it's because I'm interested in it, because I think it's important. Um, but to go deeper, it's important. I, as a researcher um, and someone talking to you all today from a place of privilege, I have to make sure that um, rather than casting indigenous people as objects to be studied, as the majority of researchers have done in the past and continue to do today, I hope through this work to dismantle the white supremacy that exists internalized in my own being and decolonize current sustainability thoughts and practices by centering indigenous traditional ecological knowledge. The lesson to be learned through implementing these reflexivity practices is the dire need to center indigenous people in sustainability studies and policy rather than rele relegating them to the periphery. It is essential that the sustainability community works proactively to decolonize our tactics and methodology when it comes to implementing sustainable practices. It's so really addressing how we can reconcile our extractionist and materialistic culture with what the current moment is calling for, a rapid and dramatic change away from fossil fuel racial capitalism. So indigenous involvement in urban sustainability is more than one might think across the globe. Many indigenous peoples are already living in urban settings, especially throughout Latin America, where at this point, more over 50% of the indigenous populations are in urban centers. And cities in general are the perfect place to start reimagining the kind of world we want to live in and strive for. Indigenous populations are disproportionately poor, suffer higher rates of unemployment and incarceration, and endure poor quality housing and health outcomes. The urban environment as it exists today does not fulfill or even begin to address the needs of indigenous dwellers. City governments and planners are not asking the right questions or providing the necessary solutions to address the low quality of life, culture and language loss, and weakened community safety nets that indigenous people are contending with in the city. And the surrounding metropolitan suburban areas. Cities are some of the most vulnerable places to the consequences of climate change and other environmental issues. But the globalized nature of cities means they are inextricably connected to ecologies around the world. Um, currently, this interaction is entirely negative and damaging, but if we can reverse the nature of these relationships, cities can have an outsized impact on environmental sustainability. As a result of the fact that cities usually have to face the world's crises and challenges before governments and countries make political action to address them, we can more realistically start implementing the rapid and far reaching change we need within the time scale required in order to prevent a climate catastrophe than if we were to try to do that on a national or global scale. And we can see today how slowly that's going when it comes to you know, commitments like the Paris Agreement or national level climate policy.
It is essential that we heed the instructions contained within place-based indigenous knowledge and scale it up to further understand our current condition and how to emerge from the toxic cycles society is currently fueled by. Indigenous cultures are not static. They are not long dead or ancient civilizations. They are not vulnerable to modernity. So it is wrong to relegate them only to what colonizer culture would deem the pristine wilderness because land that has been developed still falls within the ancestral lands of indigenous groups and therefore indigenous people should have a say in decision and policymaking in the urban space. And so we really have a lot to learn from indigenous communities around the world. Outlined here are some of the key concepts that I've looked into um, and starting with uh, reciprocity and gratitude. So through reciprocity and abiding by the law of return, we can restore our connection to each other, to other species, and to the environment and earth as a whole. So the law of return is defined by the principle by, so whatever you take, be it from the earth, another person, and so on, you should give something of what you believe to be equal value in return. Um, to practice the law of return, you must connect with what you take from on a spiritual level and give whatever feels appropriate freely. And what's really beautiful about this principle is that it doesn't really reflect what we in the Western sphere might think of as a law. It's not legally binding. There's no punishment if you don't do it. But currently we are seeing the consequences of forgetting to abide by these instructions when it, you know, looking at environmental degradation, the climate crisis, systemic injustice, and so on. Reciprocity is the practice and principle that comes from recognizing the importance of the law of return and implementing it in one's daily life and interactions. The act of braiding sweet grass, picture it here, um, is demonstrative of the good that can come from relying on others and building productive relationships. So nobody can braid sweet grass on their own. You must have someone else to hold the end so that you pull gently against each other. Reciprocity between you, the holder as vital as the braider. This ritual grounded in respect and mutual understanding helps illuminate the kinds of relationships we should be fostering between people and between people in the environment. So one of the easy ways to start incorporating and practicing reciprocity into daily life is choosing to opt out of capitalism as often as possible. Even in a market economy, we can behave as if the living world is a gift. Refusal to participate is a moral choice. So through gift giving, the gift economy, and similar anti-capitalist economic activities, such as buying secondhand, giving things away for free, pay what you can, or sliding scale models, we can distance ourselves from the toxic ideas that capitalism instigates to fuel its perpetuation. Myths and storytelling are the foundation of most if not all indigenous cultures around the world and pictured here is a sculpture by Bill Reed um, that we'll, I'll get to in a bit, but it serves as a symbol of the spirit of the post imperial age. So myths help train us to be able to quickly identify what is right in any particular context. Ways of thinking are built into myths and indigenous myths instill responsibility, the value of teaching and lenses through which relationships with and between people and the natural world can be understood. And those ideas are what has always been the central piece missing from Western ways of being that results in unsustainable practices and disconnection from nature. So this is a pretty well-known sculpture by Bill Reed. Um, and the 13 passengers in the canoe all seem to be vying for position, often facing in different directions and sometimes teetering on the edge of the boat. Yet the paddles are somehow in unison and they appear to be heading in some particular direction. So what we should take away from this sculpture is that the recognition of difference does not mean the end of unity. The emphasis on being different but together in the same process and space and finding mutual vocabulary for the figures in this book that be, being rowing um, in order to move forward in the same direction. So a big piece of the results of those kinds of practices and ways of thinking is creating, creating a connection to nature. And that can be transferred into Western scientific thought through the concept of biomimicry. So I really just wanna start with the idea that the choice between an anthropocentric and an ecocentric worldview is a false one. Learning from other species, especially ones that have been ignored and undervalued has immense potential when it comes to the betterment of our planet, both for the health of the natural environment and ecosystems and human society. Humans have always learned from their environment 
The issue in many cases, especially throughout Western culture and society, is that we have forgotten to listen for and heed the lessons so graciously shared with us by other species and other Earth systems. If we hope to restore the balance and regenerate the damage we've done, we must do so with the utmost caution or else risk winding up in the same place we started or just making things worse. I think the introduction of a new species to combat another invasive species and then they both just end up becoming invasive, it's, you know, you can just muck it up further. But indigenous peoples have always been attentive students and borrowed solutions from plants and other species without exploiting natural systems in the way that has generated the unintended consequences we are dealing with today. If we want to ensure that future generations will have the chance of attaining a higher quality of life than the situation we currently face, people, communities, and governments around the world must remember how to learn from nature again. So there are, are plenty of things that we've done wrong that as a fact that we see in front of us today, maybe more than ever because of the COVID crisis and the recent um, racial uprisings, et cetera. Um, there's plenty to complain about and plenty to work on. And maybe first and foremost is capitalism, which as an economic system thrives on the idea that one is unfulfilled and conversely recognizing abundance rather than scarcity undermines an economy that thrives by creating unmet desires. This toxicity has spread through every facet of society resulting in the diseases of systemic injustice like racism, sexism, classism, and you know, I'm sure we can unfortunately all think of many more isms that are related to this. At this point, overconsumption threatens every dimension of our well-being, but the answer is not to live with nothing or not to interact with nature or its natural resources at all. Instead, we must ask ourselves what the consequences are when we treat everything like a commodity. How do we consume in a way that does justice to the lives we take instead? and the need to resolve the inescapable tension between honoring life around us and taking it in order to live is maybe the most important part of being human. Our current socio-environmental condition is the result of the specific subtypes of urban systems humankind has developed to handle the processes required to transform resources from nature into commodities that fuel our hope for endless economic growth. It is true that urbanization is inevitably going to alter the biosphere, but it doesn't need to be as damaging as it is now. So there are many challenges to change. Um, some of them outlined here, maybe first and foremost is political will, because in order to execute changes across people and spaces, you need politics. And that for many can be the first and most um, discouraging challenge because there is always a risk that even if an important change is won in the political sphere, it will never actually have an impact due to lack of execution or enforcement. However, within these potential areas for issues lie the very same solutions. We can utilize indigenous traditional ecological knowledge to spark and guide conflict resolution surrounding sustainability throughout society. Imagine if all of our representatives in Congress and Senate had to do a reflexivity practice before they were to convene or implement the law of return in any legislation they wanted to get passed. Um, additionally, at the city level, we can kind of go around and avoid a lot of these big daunting problems because it is far more politically feasible, for example, to pass a measure limiting carbon emissions at the scale of a city than at the state or the federal level. It's just a smaller, more controlled space to practice politics. And so if these kinds of efforts are carried out simultaneously in different cities across regions or across the world, the impact could end up being parallel to what a state or federal policy would have accomplished in terms of population and climate impact with a more distributed amount of energy being put in. So hopefully would end up being a net less effort. It is also in cities where the lived impacts of problematic policies and systemic injustice come into play. Non-scientific elements are a crucial part of the picture. Questions of power, poverty, and inequality, ideology, and cultural preferences are all part of the question and the answer. Under capitalism, the only courses of action permitted to move forward without being seen as completely absurd are profitable ones, so money, because anything that doesn't in some way generate quantifiable monetary value is seen as a pointless waste of time and resources. 
it is no coincidence that an enormous share of the attention devoted to urban sustainability in the literature and in practice has been on how people as consumers and household level actors damage the environment. So think of the tweet that Shell put out a few weeks ago asking their followers how they are dealing with climate change. The irony of a giant fossil fuel company asking individual people what they're doing, I hope is obvious to all of us and is ridiculous to you as it is to me. So whether it be through reforming our current global economic infrastructure by assigning a monetary value to ecosystem services and other environmental factors, maybe carbon pricing, et cetera, or initiating a complete overhaul and transition to a different economic model, we must collectively recognize that money isn't everything and that it honestly up till now has done a bad job over the past few centuries at actually measuring progress and the improvement of humankind as a whole. The built environment, so our current infrastructure, accounts for a huge portion of our carbon emissions, discounting the activities that occur in or via buildings as well. Because currently the energy and material that flows through our human economy returns in an altered form as pollution and waste to our ecosystems and the environment. But it doesn't have to be this way. We, all, we have all of the knowledge and tools we need and the crux of the matter is that this set of flows is made by human activity and therefore it can be unmade by a change in human activity. So if like Jason and the Argonauts, we need to replace the rotting planks of our ship we sail in while we sail in it, we must do so strategically to avoid as many sacrifices and negative consequences as possible. If we try to replace too many planks at once, the ship becomes more vulnerable and is likely to fall apart. But if we are too slow, the rot may spread and prevent our ability to make repairs. By working smarter in harmony with nature, we can use and build upon those features of cities that can reorient the material and organizational ecologies of cities towards positive interactions with nature's ecologies. We, especially those complicit in Western culture, have a responsibility to work towards healing the toxic worldview that resulted in our systematically unjust world as fast as possible because today people are already be, being affected by the climate crisis and have been affected for years at this point. And as quoted here by Robin Wall Kimmerer, transformation is not accomplished by tentatively waiting at the edge. We can't wait for slow and steady policies to inch us towards solutions. We need uh, a concerted effort all facing the same way like that sculpture of the boat we saw earlier to reach this goal. And indigenous peoples, especially youth, protect, preserve, and promote their environments through practices of nurturing that are integral to their cultures and are also adapting to current social and environmental challenges. And we need to learn from that system and those ways of being to really get us to where we have to go. We at this point um, should not be thinking of American society as entirely corrupt and wholly unsustainable or that it should become pure and perfect, but rather a hybrid of both practices. Our purpose should be to move further towards sustainable practices in an evolutionary progression so that we can get where we need to be um, for ourselves and for future generations. So that's all I've got to present. Um, glad we stayed still on the time scale, even with technical difficulties. I'd love to open it up for any questions or discussion that people want to have, be it in the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask anything. Um, I know the next presentation isn't until one, but if people have to head out we early, yeah. no worries. So we have time. Well done, yeah. Seth. So I'm sure there'll be some questions for you. My favorite one, maybe because it's super strange, is using bacteria in cement so that buildings can photosynthesize. So if you put the right kind of bacteria or algae in the cement as you create it and pour it, those buildings, instead of emitting carbon dioxide over their like life cycle, can actually draw it back down because they photosynthesize using, you know, the air and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, so I don't know, that's kind of a weird one. Um, Professor Phillips has a question. In your research, did you find model examples of urban planning that incorporates indigenous values of sustainability? Yeah, so in the written thesis, which is a lot longer than this presentation has time for, I talk a little bit about some examples I found. Unfortunately, there aren't that many because of, you know, 
the, the status of the world as, as it is. And the ones I could find are pretty small scale, but there are some really great examples of, you know, town, like very local governments working with the local indigenous groups to create like a community center where group planning um, happens and, you know, issues are brought up and addressed in kind of like a public sphere. So those were the most interesting ones that were the most true to the values held by the specific communities. A lot of those are in Canada or in Australia since they more so than the United States have worked to come to terms with their um, like colonial and genocidal pasts. But, you know, hopefully as I kind of outlined here, I hope that we can scale that up to, you know, it would be great to see New York City do something with the Lenape people and address like the history of the island or, um, you know, things like that. Yeah, thanks for your questions, I'm glad. People are asking things. Is potable water the most critical issue we are facing in this in these regions? If not, what is? Would you want to come off me, Sandra? And, and at, what regions are you talking about? So I was just thinking of where the indigenous people mostly reside. Sure. So I'll, I'll give an example of a, of a water issue um, because in in reality, indigenous peoples live all over the place. I think you're referring to kind of the process of moving indigenous peoples onto reservations. And water is a huge one, especially when it comes to dealing with fossil fuels and pollution. Um, I think to me, the most striking example is what happened to the Navajo nation in the American Southwest, where basically all of the nuclear experiments that were done throughout the Cold War were just abandoned there and totally poisoned the water supply of many different um, Navajo communities throughout there. I think in a lot of ways, it is one of the most crucial issues because you need, water is life and you need it to live day to day. Um, but for, for me, I think personally, mine is the climate crisis since in so many ways it touches every issue. So you can be working on water issues, you can be working on land conservation issues and it can all be feeding into you know, our need to avert the climate crisis. But thank you for your question, that was great. Um, Tyler, were you trying to say something? I was, Seth. Good catch. Uh, I wanted to know, whenever you're talking about cities, are you talking about New York City or there's some sort of population limit going all the way down to some, like barely incorporated territory? When you say city, what do you mean? I'm mostly referring to any population dense area since generally cities have a different kind of local government structure than like a small town or village would because they have so many more people in a small space. Um, and then also the element of like the built environment. So if, like New York City and Los Angeles are really different when like geographically and spatially, but mostly because they are both so built up and have really dense populations, even if LA is much more spread out, there's a lot of potential to um, get a lot of people in the same space working on the same issues, which is harder to do, you know, throughout a rural expanse where maybe you've got one person every square mile. In New York City or in Los Angeles, you've got millions of people all in the same space, you can get working on an issue together and mobilize them much more easily. Does that answer your question? It does. My follow up to that was just going to be if, if it sounds like what, what I heard, I also my internet cut out, so I might have missed part of this. But if you're talking about how cities uh, respond to this crisis, how does it branch across cities? Because I mean, within the US in particular, cities, much larger cities are by and large incredibly democratic, but that obviously is very different from rural areas. So it, it ends up being a us versus them scenario in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the, the best examples of kind of cities working together across the country is the C40, which is a group backed by Bloomberg Green and the United Nations. And it's a lot of mayors and other officials coming together to share solutions throughout the world. I think they've got like about 90 cities right now. And I know a lot of what they do is address how, you know, maybe a city is really localized in one certain space where it's built up and all of the people live, but the resources that go into the city at this point in time come from all over the world. So there is a lot of potential for cities to connect with maybe more rural areas that have different political ideologies, but to find that common ground of, okay, maybe we in this city look really different from you and operate really different from you, but the wheat you grow in your town comes into our city. How can we align our values and goals maybe around something as simple as an economic transaction, um, but finding that common ground. And it's much easier to find common ground when you've got tons and tons of people, you know, not every single person in a city is a diehard Democrat or, you know, super progressive. There are people of all, um, you know, 
places that they can come from that you can have different relationships set up. There's just a lot more human resource in a city than, you know, in a very rural space. I'm not sure if I'm rambling or if I'm answering your question. Um, oh, one more question in the chat. Are there any examples of legislation that embedded reciprocity? So I think maybe just because it's been on everyone's mind a little bit, the first one that comes to mind to me is the Green New Deal. It's maybe one of the first like legislations that kind of tries to cover every issue that our society is facing at one time. And there are a couple of sections in there that do specifically address the need to bring indigenous peoples into the conversation, restore land rights and have the people who know the land the best be responsible for the land. Um, and there are a lot of different ways to practice reciprocity. It's not just, you know, returning your compost to the land after you do a harvest. You can practice reciprocity through political actions. Um, in one of the books I read, Robin Wall Kimmer talks a lot about how for her writing is an act of reciprocity since she's putting to word her responsibility to the land and to other people. Um, so I think with the, the right perspective and mindset, any piece of legislation can have reciprocity embedded in it, even if it's not directly tied to um, the environment in some way. Sonia asks, what role do you see public education playing in raising awareness and understanding of these values? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, I mean, I know you through Keep Rockwood Beautiful do a lot at, in the past, I've done a lot of school visits and stuff. I think this would be a really cool thing to bring in to schools with people from all ages to learn about what it means to connect with nature and give back to nature and understand what nature teaches us and not just what we have to learn like scientifically about um, what goes on in the environment. So I know like the, the camp that I went to and I worked at, we talk a lot about gratitude and kindness. And those are two of the really great ways to be doing reciprocity and to be understanding kind of these far reaching issues. It's really hard to contextualize climate change since it is so big and can apply to everything. It's hard to pin it down and define it, but understanding like a similar concept like gratitude or reciprocity, it's easy to transfer like, okay, I know what it means to be really nice to my friend when they're feeling sad. Now I can think about how does it, what does it mean to be really nice to the earth or to my local environment when that person is suffering, even if it's not a human being. Oh. Yeah. Someone's asking, will there be a recording available this presentation? Yes, I think. Yes, uh, Patty we're recording. recording. Yes. And yeah, sure. I'll, I'll definitely be posting this somewhere on the internet afterwards for people to share around if they want to watch it back. Mm -hmm. um, Sandra asks, what group do you find to be the most influential and productive in your research? Um, definitely the favorite, my favorite thing that I read for this was Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is where I got that um, analogy of braiding sweetgrass. I highly recommend it. It's written almost like poetry, but it is really chock full of cool ecological knowledge and, you know, political theory as well. Um, <clears throat> she's a great researcher. She, she teaches at SUNY ESF, so We've got her in the SUNY system too, which is a great asset to uh, us. Yeah, that's definitely my favorite. I also recommend um, the Indigenous Environmental Network and the Climate Justice Alliance, especially since Climate Justice Alliance, they kind of bring together lots of different groups from local, regional, and national scales working um, on these issues. And many of them are groups directly associated with Indigenous groups around the country and around the world. How diverse was your research when it comes to indigenous peoples? Was it coalesced around any particular region or were there any sort of discrepancies you found interesting, even though in general, I would imagine the, the through line is pretty similar? Yeah, definitely. I, I was trying to focus a lot on what you said, like that through line. So what they all have in common since, you know, because there are so many indigenous groups around the world and they are all so different from each other. Uh, um, you know, it would be really hard to compare like the Sami people from Scandinavia to the Mapuche from Chile. They, they, you know, they really have nothing in common except for this really interesting and important connection to their land and the, the way that they carry out their relationships 
with the world. Um, and so that's what I was trying to focus on. So that kind of like distillation of, okay, all of their traditions and their practices are super different, but what is that through line that they all have that allows them to exist in unity with nature that the, you know, the Western mindset has lost somewhere along the way um, and like led to us, you know, we're not con considered to be indigenous peoples because we don't connect with others and nature in the same way that they do. And we don't have that relationship um, to the land. And there are there is some theory and talk by indigenous people out there, like, what does it mean for someone to become indigenous? Is that even possible? Because it's not really like an ethnic thing. It's not a genetic thing that makes you capable of that interaction. Um, but I didn't really get to dive into that as much as I wanted because of the you know, constraints of this project, but maybe that would be something interesting for future research. Like what does it mean to become indigenous to a place and is that possible? And what would it mean for everybody to try to become indigenous to the place that they live? Would it help our relationship or would it, you know, I'm not sure. Seth, I, I, I'm just looking up in Google and it says that uh, the UN reports 370 million indigenous people around the world in 70 countries worldwide. Would you, have you looked at that number and seen if that's correct? Or is that an antiquated number? I'm not sure. I'm not a demographer. So I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you whether or not that's accurate. I, the United Nations has a lot of really um, good, if not great programs to connect with and work with indigenous peoples throughout the world and try to elevate their voices. I think historically, they've done a lot of effort to try to get them involved and then lacked on actually executing what they've asked for and what they recommend. Um, so I think that's, the UN has a lot of room for improvement in that respect. Um, but I, I'm not 100% sure on that number. I would err on the side of trusting the UN since they generally have pretty good numbers when it comes to things like this, but I, I'm, I, I couldn't tell you. I feel like earlier in one of your answers, you said that I think it was Canada and Australia are back better at reckoning with their colonial past than the US is. Why do you think that is? Definitely would like to clarify better is still a really low bar. Um, and I and it's to be blunt, I think it's because there are more indigenous peoples left in Canada and Australia than there are in the US, and they haven't been as systemically like segmented and disempowered for as long as they have been here. And while there definitely were efforts to eradicate indigenous peoples throughout all of the Americas and all of Australia and in most of the world, um, they, for whatever reason, it might be like, you know, key cultural differences of resilience or, you know, geographical factors, if they had an easier time running from the colonizers and were able to establish more um, permanent communities in response to that. Um, I also think that the, the politics are really different where, you know, in Australia, I have friends there who have talked to me about like, they grew up in a place with a really, you know, Aboriginal name and like next to the reservation. And then and it didn't come up at all. And it was very much ignored. Um, where I think in America, we tried really hard to assimilate Indigenous peoples into like the white standard and uh, take away their language and teach them how to be American. Um, so I'm not sure, a lot of different factors. I know that wasn't very clear, but it wasn't a central point of my research. So I'm kind of just riffing. Hello, number one son, great presentation. I just wanna ask, what do you think is the single most important thing that any single person can do in terms of addressing what you're talking about and trying to make a difference? I think that definitely it's that exploration of a, of a reciprocity practice and figuring out what it means to you to give back. We all take things from the world to live. We, you know, be that literally like you eat meat and so an animal dies for you to live or you breathe from the air and that air came from plants and finding the ways that resonate most with you to return that gift to, you know, the world. Um, and that can be through anything, be it, you know, if you want to start a garden and start composting and restore the soil biome in your backyard, or you want to join a nonprofit that's advocating 
for a fossil fuel free future. Or if you want to donate food to a food pantry and feed someone in your community that might be in How need. How about picking up rusty metal objects on the side of the road? That's a, per that's a great one. Uh, you know, sign up with Sonia to do a, a cleanup. Um, lots of different things. And it's, you know, anybody can do it. And that's what we have to learn, I think, in a lot of ways from, you know, these indigenous groups is that they all do it every day in many ways without thinking because it's what they've been taught for so long. It's so ingrained in their worldview that it just is what you do. It's not something that you think about and have to um, really try hard at because it ends up coming naturally at some point. And it, and it you know, nourishes you and it nourishes your um, community and it nourishes your environment. Were you able to interview anyone or multiple people who are actually indigenous or do you have friends who you could run the, run this research by them and get their thoughts or anything like that? No, I tried to. It was um, more challenging than I expected it to be to find a substantial number of people in the time frame. I'd, I'd love to do that and I'd love to you know work on this further and be more involved in this kind of work and support. Um, this, uh, yeah, that's definitely something that I wish I had been able to do more and kind of get feedback from people who actually belong to indigenous communities on this. Um, but almost, I would say like at least 80%, if I'm just making up a percentage that feels right of the authors that I read to support this are indigenous peoples and work extensively in this field. And um, that, that was really interesting and rewarding to kind of read them critically assessing the past like research on indigenous peoples that was like colonizers cataloging um, things and kind of, you know, as I said, making indigenous peoples objects to be studied um, and then kind of moving past that and really reflecting on themselves and their own experiences. I think um, Eli's got a question. Have you seen examples of indigenous representations of land maps which depart from Western maps? And if so, what do you think the link is between engaging with the land and representing it in some way on paper Etc. No, I haven't. If you have any cool maps like that that you want to share with me, I would love to see them. Um, that's a really great question that I have no answer to. And I am grateful that you said that because it's given me something cool to think about. But no, I haven't. That sounds great. Beth, most, um, this is Joanna, most states have a historical society. Um, have you had a chance to look, for example, in New York State to see what documents the Historical Society has? No, I have not. I decided pretty um, early on in the research that I didn't want to focus specifically on any one particular Indigenous group. And like I was telling Tyler, kind of find that through thread um, to, you know, kind of do this larger overview. I think that... Um, you know, for a lot, a lot of people here live in the Hudson Valley where I'm from. And so maybe that would be a great kind of next step is to really try to, you know, find the people, and this can apply to anyone, find the people where you live who are indigenous to that place. And if they're not there, find out what happened to them. And historical societies are a great way to do that. Um, and to, you know, keep that history alive. And then also remember that it's cur currently happening now. Indigenous peoples aren't something of the past. They exist alive and well um, today. And, but history is a really great way to connect with these, these same ideas. Yeah. I have seen this map. Thank you, Tyler. I do know that one. Seth, um, I'm, I had two questions. One is in, if in your research you found practices that uh, you might suggest to us for Thanksgiving indigenous practices that we could use in place of um, our, or not in place of, add to our traditions for Thanksgiving that we might be able to promote among our friends. And the second is more of a, um, a suggestion or whatever. Um, uh, are you familiar with uh, Leonard, Lena um, the Ramapo, <laughs> his name's Leonard, the Ramapo Lenape tribe here? In in uh, Rockland, I am. I'm not familiar. I know that in Rockland and most of the Hudson Valley and a lot of the Northeast is Lenape land. 
Yes. But um, I, I didn't get a chance to connect with any individual. So um, I might suggest um, to, well, contacting them, which the, is easy, you know, you can find them easily, but also to look at a film that um, I think his name is Brooklyn Demi, Jonathan Demi's son recently yeah. did. And he's very much a part, and I think he still lives in Nyack. He's very much a part of the movement to um, support the lives of the people who are there trying to live um, in accordance with their, their traditions and their lifestyles, their chosen lifestyles. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you, Sonia. Do, do you know the name of the movie? That's, I don't remember it right now, <laughs> but I can find it. <laughs> Great, yeah, if you can come up with it, I would love to, I would love yeah. to take a look at that. We could Google that. Um, and then for your first question, I think that uh, to, you know, to not be repeating myself too much, but, you know, maybe starting off your Thanksgiving dinner, talking about like the history of Thanksgiving and what it means that we now in our homes on this land that was taken from the people who created Thanksgiving are celebrating it without them present and without them in the space that was, that is their ancestral home. Um, I've seen on the internet some kind of fun ways to think about it where maybe you're not celebrating with your family this year because of the COVID pandemic. This is a great time to remember that the reason many indigenous peoples died was because of, of, of pandemics, be it smallpox or other illnesses that were brought over by colonizers when they first came to the Americas. That's, that's a great thing to keep in mind where you know history repeats itself. We're going through this pandemic and so did the indigenous peoples of the Americas and other, and other places. Um, and yeah, I, th I think that we have a lot, we have a lot to learn when it comes to gratitude. And I think that Thanksgiving is a really great time that we all try to do that. And maybe it doesn't come across that way. Maybe for some, it is more of like a day of excess and abundance, but I think there's a way to reframe it to make it more about th actually giving thanks and like remembering that that's what those words means. It's not how much turkey can I eat in like this four hour extravagant dinner, but like really to be grateful and thankful for the people you get to be with and the food you get to eat and the life you get to live. Um, so I, I personally am not a fan of when people call it thanks taking because I think that it is a good opportunity to do the gratitude. Um, so yeah, just be as grateful as you can. And Thanksgiving is a great time to kind of refresh that uh, calling in a lot of ways. I know you said you kind of pulled the numbers out of thin air, but whenever you said about 80, 20 of your, of the authors that you pulled from were indigenous versus non, what would you describe the differences as? Does anything come to mind when I ask that? Yeah, so one of the papers I read specifically about reflexivity practice was written by a white Australian woman whose husband is an Aboriginal Australian. And what the paper was about was kind of her experiences like being treated as an expert on Aboriginal issues because she was married to an Indigenous person. Um, and so that, that was a really, where she kind of picked apart like, well, what, how was I treated before I was married to this person and how was I treated after? I had been studying the same things in both of those settings, but you might, you know, she was kind of addressing like how her privilege changed from one to the next in that space. Um, so that was a really cool, like kind of blatant, like really self-aware paper that was written about that specifically. Um, a lot of the things that I, I read that weren't by indigenous peoples weren't about indigenous people. So a lot of the, the papers I read on city planning and activism in cities didn't really take into account in indigenous peoples and their involvement, which maybe is the biggest different where difference where, you know, indigenous peoples are in cities. They don't just like live in the woods. Um, and they are an important part of, of the fabric of any community. Um, it, you know, if they are still there, if they weren't totally you know, run off the land. Um, and so that, I think that's important. You know, maybe not everything is about it at all times, but there's a lot of opportunity to bring these ideas into anything you end up talking about, um, which I, I think is pretty important and, and also very useful. Seth, I think it's about time for our next speaker. This is yeah, really been, absolutely. I've really been impressed with um, the dialogue and the exchange and just the, kind of the conversational tone of your presentation. And I just, look forward to following your work and what's going to become what's going to be coming next Thank so, you it's, so much. it's it's exciting really it was just um there, there was just so so much to think about 
from your presentation. And I really appreciated the audience, the audience questions and the comments. So thank you, Seth. Bravo. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you so much for coming. If you have another bit of time, you should stay for Mary's presentation. It sounds like it's going to be awesome. Um, so you can just stay in this room if you want to hear my friend. We're going to be in this room for a while. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> We're going to be having a number of presentations. We're going to be in this room for a while, but I am recording, so I will be able to get that re the recording too. Okay. Congratulations. Perfect. Thanks so much, Seth. Congratulations. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Great job. Congratulations. Great to see everybody here. Yeah, yeah it was Thanks, a great Seth. turnout. It's a great Good. turnout. Congratulations, Seth. Excelente. Gracias, profesora. Ya mis abuelos están felices que estás hablando español. Yo sé, ahí los veo, sí, saludos. La profesora de español, ¿ves? Sí, que está ahí, qué bueno. Hola, profesora, mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. Sí, Adiós.